Hello everyone, welcome to our webcast. Today we will be talking about creating fire-enabled experiences, leveraging the API-first approach. This is Ashma Gupta from Apogee. I lead the healthcare vertical with focus on API and analytics. In this role, I have a privilege to closely work with our market clients, including industry-leading pairs, providers, and farmers on their digital strategies and in identifying transformative opportunities, FIRE being one of them. Prior to joining the firm, I was leading the digital health incubations at Kaiser and drove innovation around multitude of digital capabilities, including launch of our first public API. It's a true honor to introduce my co-presenter, Josh Mandel, who's joining us live from Boston for today's webcast. Josh is the brains behind the Smart on Fire initiative and is also the lead architect for Smart Project, which is a four-year collaboration between Harvard Medical School and Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Josh, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Please go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Uh, well, thanks a lot. This is Josh Mandel. I'm on the research faculty at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, Harvard Medical School and I've been working for the last uh, just about five years as the architect on the Smart Platforms project and excited to talk to everyone today about Smart and Fire and interoperability in general. Thank you, Josh. And before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. All the videos, including today's webcast, will be uploaded to YouTube uh, Apogee's channel and all the slides that we will cover here today will also be uploaded on slideshare.net slash Apogee. So with that, a quick run through the agenda. We would begin with a short overview of the core problem that we are trying to solve with FIRE. We will then have Josh share with us the work that Smart on FIRE has been trailblazing for a number of years. Then I'll share Apogee's perspective in specifically what we are bringing to the table to accelerate FIRE adoption for our clients. And we will have Q&A at the end. So Josh, there has been much enthusiasm in the health IT industry regarding the new health data standard from HL7, FIRE. Everyone involved with the health data, be it the EMR vendors, be it device companies, hospital CIOs, even app developers, they all have high hopes in FIRE's promise. I would like for you to kick us off by sharing your perspectives on FIRE from the field. What is the problem we are trying to solve? Why is there so much excitement? And frankly, what is the motivation behind FIRE? Excellent. Well, well, thanks a lot. I'm excited at the opportunity to do that. And uh, let me just launch into sharing my screen in order to um, help provide some background and, and overview here. So I'd like to, to dig into FIRE uh, from the perspective of a little bit of, of history. So I want to tell you briefly the story of the Smart Platforms Project. Uh, and this is a project that came out of an idea from Harvard Medical School um, right around the time when the iPhone came out. Uh, and uh, in the consumer world, we were getting used to the idea uh, that we could try out new applications on a phone. If better apps come along, you could get rid of the old ones and swap in the new ones. Uh, and Zach Kahane and Ken Mandel at uh, Harvard Medical School proposed uh, that it would be really nice if electronic health records could work this way, too. Uh, and we were funded with a four-year, $15 million uh, grant from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT uh, to explore this idea of building APIs uh, on top of health information technology. Uh, and at a very high level, the, the motivation was to let people with ideas about how working with healthcare data should work uh, to implement those ideas in the real world. Uh, so this is a picture from an article in Wired magazine five years ago. Uh, Wired uh, effectively held a, a showcase for information visualization designers. And they said, uh, what you see on the screen here is not a very effective way uh, to help patients or physicians interpret lab results and motivate change in behavior to improve health. Uh, and what would it look like if we could re-envision better ways to view these data? And one of the submissions uh, that was made to this Wired gallery was from Dave McCandless and Stephanie Postevec. They uh, run a blog called Information is Beautiful, and they came up with a design which they published under a Creative Commons license, which was visualizing a risk score, visualizing a set of lab results and patient demographics in a way that was readily interpretable. So rather than just looking at raw numbers, looking at raw cholesterols and C-reactive proteins, they used them to compute a risk score, uh, and that's how likely is this patient to have a heart attack or a stroke in the next 10 years. 
Uh, and they published this image under a Creative Commons license uh, for non-commercial use. So we were able to take it and, and we said, well, this is a great idea, but wouldn't it be better if instead of just publishing a picture, if developers had a way to publish applications so that we could share our ideas about how to transform healthcare, not at the level of journal articles, which are important, or pictures, which are motivational, but applications, which could be used directly in the field. Um, and so we took this, app, uh, this image and turned it into an app using a set of APIs that we defined over time. Um, and you could see we, we basically did a pixel for pixel reproduction of the image from Wired Magazine, uh, and then added just a couple interactive elements. So you could start to ask the question, if this is somebody with high blood pressure who's smoking, uh, what would be the effect if you quit smoking? You could cut your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, if you get your blood pressure under control and you quit smoking, you cut that risk almost in half. Uh, so that becomes suddenly not just a static image in the magazine, but a conversational tool. And there's thousands of ideas like this for how we could make better use and better sense of the data in our healthcare systems. And so from smart platforms perspective, the goal was to try to say, how can we design an API to let these apps plug into a diverse number of different healthcare IT systems? So the last time I, I surveyed this space was a few months ago, and there were over, just over 1,000 uh, certified EHRs uh, that were certified um, for uh, the 2014 certification criteria to do a patient-facing function called view and download and transmit. So it's 1,000 different systems that were certified to share data with patients. Uh, but they all work a little differently. They generally have a web-based portal that a patient signs into, and then they all have their own way of laying out information uh, and navigating through your healthcare data. Um, and very few of them offer automated interfaces that let applications plug in. So the goal here it was to say, what would it take in order to run one application across many or most of those systems? And effectively, when we boil it down, these applications need access to clinical data. That's the number one most important thing without which uh, they just can't get started. Uh, but they also need to be able to get authorized to access those data in a consistent way. They need to know who the end user is. How do you authenticate uh, the person sitting in front of the screen? Uh, and they need some way to integrate with the user experience of the rest of the system. So the Smart Platforms project was effectively about uh, trying to select standards and design a specification for all four of those uh, bins, client, clinical data, authorization, authentication, and the user experience around those things. Uh, and SMART is an acronym. It stands for Substitutable Medical Applications and Reusable Technology. And I just want to describe very briefly this notion of substitutability. Um, and so what we see on the screen right here is one SMART-enabled electronic health record system that can run several different applications. So for example, a, an application that helps manage blood pressure, an application that helps manage medications, and an application that calculates cardiac risk. And so from the perspective of the electronic health record and the users of that system, substitutability means choice. It means you can try out a different medication manager. Uh, if a better one comes along, you can get rid of your old one and swap in a new one. So for, for the EHR and the users and, and patients, substitutability means choice. But if we flip this picture on its head, for, for app developers, if you're building one of these apps, substitutability means reuse, because you can plug this app into any system that supports the appropriate open APIs. So I should emphasize that all the work we've been doing, we call this an open platform, because it's based on specifications that are openly available. Everything that we publish um, is open source uh, and available for implementers to take and use as they see fit. I won't dwell on the architecture diagram here because I really want to describe the clinical data APIs, but at a very high level, uh, the idea is that any one of a number of different underlying health IT systems, uh, including new ones that you can build today, uh, can fuel a clinical application with data. And these apps can run on a mobile device or the apps can run embedded inside of a traditional uh, electronic health record system that a clinician might use. I'll say just very briefly on the security side that we use open standards. We use OAuth 2 for access delegation. And the basic problem there is we've got an end user uh, who wants to connect two different parties together. The end user wants to authorize an app to access data from a health holder, uh, from a health data holder, like a EHR, a hospital, or a clinic. And the goal of OAuth is to help these three parties come together and allow the user to authorize the app to access data in the system. So it's a delegation protocol because the user is delegating uh, or sharing some of the permissions that she already has uh, with an application. 
So without saying much more about the security side, although it's an extremely important part of the platform, I want to focus today on the healthcare data standards. And the question is, what does it take? What do we really need in order to open up access to the data inside of a healthcare system uh, for these substitutable apps to plug in? Uh, and our, from our perspective on the Smart Platforms project, number one, we wanted a set of standards that were open, that developers could download the documentation for, uh, could share it with anyone they wanted, uh, and if they needed to, they could modify and extend to suit their needs. Um, and so FIRE provides an open set of data models uh, that are released under a Creative Commons Zero license. It's effectively public domain. Uh, and in addition to these data models, FIRE also provides a REST API, a standard way to talk to a server and request data from that server. And I'll dig in with a few examples to give you a quick sense of what that looks like. Um, and then I'll give you a live tour of the smart uh, of the FIRE specification. I'll show you a little bit um, of what it looks like so you can know how to get started working with FIRE. So we got involved uh, in FIRE about two years ago uh, when we realized that this was a set of open APIs that really suited our needs for an app platform very well. Uh, and since then, I've become more deeply involved with the standards development community, and I'm now a member of the, the FIRE management group uh, and the FIRE core team. So I've been uh, pretty closely involved over the last 18 months or so. High-level picture, what is FIRE? Uh, for me, FIRE is a set of uh, data models, which FIRE calls resources. And today, in the, we're right now between the first draft publication and the second draft publication of the spec. There's about 100 resources that are defined, and they broadly fit within three or four buckets. Um, the biggest bucket today is clinical resources, and these are things like medication prescriptions um, or vital signs, for example, which are used, uh, which use an observation resource. Uh, things like um, lab results, which also use an observation resource. Um, these basic clinical resources represent the structured data that you might find in your health record. In addition to the clinical resources, there are administrative resources that keep track of things like patients. Who are the providers in a healthcare system? What are the different locations at which a hospital uh, might have clinics? How are those locations related to each other? Uh, the, those are what FIRE calls administrative resources. And then there's a set of infrastructure resources, which defines um, low-level details about how to ship data around back and forth over the wire. Uh, in the second draft of FIRE, there's also one more category of resources, which is financials, covering things like eligibility and claims. And those are some of the, the newest pieces of the FIRE data models to emerge. So in addition to these resources, each resource is built up uh, of a set of building blocks, which FIRE calls data types. So if I want to talk about a patient, I say that patient uh, has a name. Well, how do I represent that name? How is it structured? FIRE has something called a human name. Uh, and that is a data type that defines individual fields inside of it. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, if I want to describe a date or a time or a range of dates, FIRE has data types that cover those kinds of elements as well. Uh, and FIRE also has a set of what you might call modeling tools built in. Um, so the FIRE resources are defined in terms of FIRE itself. So the, the specification allows you to define these resources um, and then use the resources once you've defined them. So that's very abstract. What I'd like to do is dig in and show you what this stuff looks like uh, over the wire. And I'll start with a couple of examples. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like to query for data. So let's say you're writing a FIRE application. And um, somehow, from somewhere, you got the ID of a patient. And then you want to fetch details about that patient once you've got the ID. Um, so every resource in FIRE has a URL. And the URL uh, is relative to the base path of the FIRE server. So you know the URL of your FIRE server and you know you want to find patient 1032702. Well, what does that look like? I'm just going to click on the link in my example here, and it'll take me to uh, a web page in my browser, which is the base URL of a server that we host at Smart Platforms. It's uh, an open server, meaning anyone can visit this server and browse around uh, and read data from it or write data to it. Um, and all you have to do is go to the URL of this patient, and what you get uh, is either a JSON or an XML payload representing the structured data for this patient. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but I'll say, for example, we could see this patient has um, a name. And if you dig into the name, you can see there's a given name, which is uh, Amy V, and a family name, which is Shaw. Uh, and even if you've never seen a, 
piece of fire data before, you have a pretty good idea of what these fields mean. Uh, they're named in an intuitive way. It's designed to be implementer friendly. It's designed to work the same way as lots of other contemporary web APIs work. Um, the, the goal here is not to do things in a special way for healthcare uh, when we can do them in a way that's worked very, very well in the broad consumer market. Um, so, so here's a, another example of a field here. This is a date which represents the patient's birth date. Uh, again, the fields are named in a pretty intuitive way. Uh, and my hope is that this isn't too surprising for folks who, uh, who have worked with REST APIs before, um, but it may be a little bit surprising for folks who have worked uh, with healthcare data before, uh, because not a lot of healthcare data standards uh, define this level of concrete and ready implement, readily implementable uh, resources. So in addition to just getting one resource from the server, we can also issue a query. So for example, I can query the server for all patients named uh, Amy uh, by adding a search parameter to my URL here. So instead of fetching one patient, I'll say, get me all the patients where name equals Amy. Uh, and then what I get back is what's called a bundle. It's a set of resources that match my search. In this case, there's four total results. I'm highlighting that here on the screen. And if I scroll down, I'll see an array of patients. Uh, and each individual patient has the same kind of data as the one that I showed you a moment ago. But I get a whole page worth of results instead of just fetching a single patient. Again, this shouldn't be surprising, but it should give you a sense uh, of, of the power of opening up healthcare data by representing it in a consistent and readily implementable way. Last example that I'll show you here is a query on observations. So this is a query to fetch blood pressures. Um, and this highlights a key point that in FHIR, most clinical data are coded. And so if we're talking about observations like blood pressures, each observation will typically have a code from LOINC. Uh, which is a coding system that represents uh, basically things you can measure. And so here I've got the code for a combined systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And if I click on this link, that will do a search uh, for all the blood pressures uh, that we have in the system. And for each individual blood pressure, if I scroll down, um, I can see, for example, that the blood pressure has two components. It has a systolic component and a diastolic component. Uh, and in FHIR, these components can be represented as separate resources. So I can represent the whole blood pressure as one thing, the systolic part of it as another thing, and the diastolic part of it as a third thing. Or the really powerful aspect of that kind of modeling is that it means when I'm building an app, I can query for just the kind of data that I want. Uh, so for example, in the cardiac risk uh, calculator that I showed you earlier, the only input to that calculator is a, a systolic blood pressure. The calculation doesn't care about diastolic blood pressure, and so my app can just query for a systolic. But if I'm building an app that um, shows me vital sign trends over time, for example, that app can fetch the systolic and the diastolic together. That's just a, a quick example of what the query API inside of Fire looks like. Uh, and then what I would like to do is to give you a tour of the Fire specification itself so you can see how these pieces fit together and where to go to learn more. Um, and the first point I'll make is you can Google for the Fire spec. Again, this might seem trivial if you've worked uh, in the consumer web world before, but if you've worked with HL7 specifications before, they're not always that easy to Google. Fire is very easy to Google. Um, if you just Google for the word Fire, F-H-I-R, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, the first hit is the actual spec itself um, hosted on the HL7 website, and it's something you can just browse online uh, and explore. And again, this is different from, from many earlier specs that come out of the HL7 world, uh, where first you have to sign up as a member, and then you can log in, and you can download a, a zip file which you extract, um, and only after you do all those things can you see the content. Uh, with Fire, uh, the content is very clear and readily available on the web. So uh, at the top of the screen here is this yellow bar saying that this is the current official version of Fire, which is the DSTU, or draft standard for trial use, uh, number one, uh, and this is an important point about FHIR, is that it's an evolving standard. Um, there's very good work being done to improve the coverage of basic data types, um, to make sure that we iron out any inconsistencies across the data types and across the resources, uh, and to inform this experience um, by real-world implementations. So I'm going to click on the list uh, here in, at the top of the screen, the list of officially published versions, uh, and I'll show you um, the most up-to-date one, which is what's called the current version. And this is part of a continuous integration build, so anytime anybody in the community makes a change, it's readily available right here, uh, and we can dig in. So within the spec, I'll just give you a couple starting points for when you're browsing on your own. Um, one of the key pages to look at is this list of resources, which we can get to from the top of the screen. 
And I mentioned Fire has about 100 resources today, uh, and this is where you can see the entire list divided into the categories of clinical resources, administrative resources, infrastructural resources, and at the bottom here, financial resources. Each one of these resources uh, has a web page dedicated to describing how it works. And I'll just show you a quick example of the medication prescription resource. Uh, it probably does what it sounds like it does. It represents a prescription that's being, been written for a particular patient. There's some background information about when to use a prescription and how a prescription is different from other related data types in the medications world. Uh, but for our purposes, I'm just going to scroll down to the actual data model itself to show you how this structure is represented in FHIR. I'll zoom in a little bit to make this easier to read. Um, but at a high level, we can look at this data model for a medication prescription and see that there's a set of fields or a set of properties that each medication prescription has. And so, for example, a prescription has a date written, and it can have either a zero or one. So the cardinality of this field is zero or one. It means it's an optional field. And the data type, if this date written is present, is the date written has to be a date time. Um, a medication prescription can have a set of dosage instructions, how to take it, and how often, and when. And if we dig into those doses instructions, we can see that it consists of uh, information about timing, information about uh, periods when, when, when it's scheduled, uh, information about what route to take it, whether it's an oral medication, for example, or something injectable, um, and information about how much to take, which is the actual dose. The other thing that the FHIR resources contain are links to other resources. Um, so for example, how do we know which patient this medication prescription has been written for? Uh, we don't repeat all the details about the patient every time we want to express a prescription. So I don't have to say this is a prescription for John Smith who was born on January 5th, 1982. Uh, instead, I just have a link to my patient. So when you want to express uh, relations between two different resources, FHIR has um, the notion of a, a link or a reference between two individual pieces of data. Uh, so when I have a medication prescription dot patient, that patient is a link to another FHIR resource of type patient, and then my prescription has a link to a, a prescriber, which is a link to a FHIR resource of the type uh, practitioner. And if you don't know what a practitioner is and you want to learn more, you can just click on the word practitioner here in the spec, and that'll take me to the resource definition for the practitioner resource, which represents a, a healthcare practitioner, like a, a physician, for example. And again, the layout of this page is, is very similar to the medication prescription page. We can see background, why this resource exists and the data model for a practitioner. A practitioner has a name and an address and a gender and a birth date, uh, maybe a photograph, and so on. So those are the basic data models that FHIR defines, and today there's about 100 of these resources. Um, and going back to prescription, I want to show you uh, one more aspect of what these data models define. So we talked about the fields and their cardinalities and their data types, but if I scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, I'll find one other important aspect of the FHIR resource definitions which is what's called search parameters. So by default, FHIR defines a set of parameters that you can use when you're searching for a resource in a server. So if I want to find a medication prescription, I can search for it by any of these fields listed in this table here. So I can search for it by patient, uh, I can search for it by the medication, which drug was actually prescribed, or by the date on which it was written, uh, or by an encounter. And so if I know uh, some combination of those things, for example, I want to find all prescriptions about John Smith um, that were written this year, I can use a combination of two search parameters, uh, one for patient and one for the date on which the prescription was written. And with those two parameters, I can construct a query uh, that any FHIR server uh, knows how to support. So a FHIR server supports resources, and then it also supports these search parameters which can be used in a standard way along with the FHIR REST API uh, to make queries or, or searches for these resources and return them consistently. That's a quick tour of the FHIR specification. I, I hope you get a sense of what the parts are and how they fit together. I definitely recommend that you browse the specification and also check out uh, some of the open reference implementations. Side by side, reading the spec and exploring an actual server that's openly available on the web is probably the best way to learn what's going on here. Um, and I'll close just by talking a, a little bit about the Smart on Fire community that's evolving here. Uh, there's been a, a strong push from electronic health record vendors, including through an organization called Argonaut, uh, which includes uh, five vendors, 
Cerner and Epic and Athena Health and Meditech uh, and McKesson, and a growing community of implementation effort around this Argonaut project. And so Argonaut is using uh, Fire, and it's using the smart authorization protocols under the hood. Um, we see a community developing of healthcare provider organizations, including Hospital Corporation of America, uh, including uh, a group called the Healthcare Services Platform Coalition, um, including Intermountain Healthcare. We see participation from data networks like SureScripts, from some of the content development um, organizations, including British Medical Journal, from some pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and the Smart Platforms Project is supported by an advisory committee that includes many of these organizations that have contributed to the subsequent development uh, of our platform. Um, so that's a, a quick overview. Uh, happy to turn it back over to Ashima, and I will stick around, of course, so we could do some questions. Thank you so much, Josh. Thanks for sharing such an in-depth and informative uh, presentation on FIRE. Listening to you, Josh, passionately make the case of FIRE, I'm even more convinced that the, this is our moment to seize in healthcare in terms of interoperability with FIRE. So let me shift gears in terms of Apogee's healthcare vision and how we are involved with Project Argonaut and FIRE work. So as Josh talked about the substitutability of the app and building the consumer-driven, personalized uh, app ecosystem, there's a strong belief that understanding the needs of our consumers, their behavior, their lifestyle, their context, and then predicting and coordinating the most effective intervention or right intervention at the right time will lead to better health outcomes. And that requires a solid foundation to not only connect, but also to collect and curate the data across different data silos. In the post fire enabled world, there will be multiple of substitutable apps that will help consumers make better health decisions. And those apps need to connect to the MRs and that's where fire comes in, that's where Project Argonaut comes in. We also believe that in addition to the apps, it's also about creating a connected experience which is empowering from the consumer standpoint. And at Apogee, we are looking into innovating on top of fire implementation and bringing the same foundation technology that powered the internet, aka APIs and REST protocol to digitally connect the world of healthcare. So how do you do that? So uh, this is a very typical health IT landscape. Um, it is overly complex and rightfully so. So in this picture, if you see in the bottom, that's what we call your current EMR implementations, the pharmacy data, it may have be your membership systems, labs, radiologies, it could be your ecosystem partners. So this is where the data for a patient reside. We call this layer a system of record layer. And then we, when you look at the top of this uh, slide, these are the new innovations that are hitting the health IT landscape. These innovations are in terms of substitutable apps, it could be your remote monitoring, telehealth, all these innovations are struggling for their mind share in the already complicated health IT landscape. While the magic may lie in, the, in the, one of these innovations, the trick is to connect the system of engagement with the system of record. And that's where we believe establishing a digital health platform will be key to achieve interoperability. And the way we see it, the digital health platform that exposes the fire APIs to share data will be the central component. And it needs to tackle three things. One is it needs to connect the system of record with system of engagement, this is the era of substitutable apps. It needs to follow the data access via open technologies like APIs and it needs to do it in a standardized way and that's where we get excited about when we hear about FIRE. It is uh, for the ecosystem partners to, to share the data, it needs to be in the standardized format and what the, the format that Josh shared with the REST APIs and, and the resource definition and having a common vocabulary would allow for that. So now let me share with you our Apogee's our roadmap to value on fire. 
So as I shared with you, we are innovating on fire implementation by building on our core strengths and that go back to API management. Uh, this is the same API management technology that we are powering for different verticals like retail, telco, financial, and billions of transactions run through this product. Uh, and I will now share with you our offering in this space. At the heart of it, it is the Apigee's core product, which is API management. And it talks about and it, uh, the, the stuff that Josh mentioned about security, OAuth, uh, token management, security, all that is inbuilt and part of the core product. I call this our onion slide or layered slide, and that's where, which is our core, and now we are innovating on top of that. The second layer is the fire specific extensions. These extensions are to enable acceleration on fire. So think of them as fire ready API, some fire specific analytics, that will help accelerate if you choose to go into fire journey. And then the third layer is around customized assets. We realize that each of the implementation in our uh, in the health IT landscape could, slide, could be slightly different. In that, we want to map the internal databases that you have, which are non-fire, to a fire format, and we want to make that journey easy. In that, we are bringing the connective framework to allow for these mappings. And finally, as Josh shared, the fire standard is going under, it's, it's evolving, and there's new standard that will be coming in, and as such, we want to be connected with thought leaders like Josh Mandel, like initiators like SMART, to learn and get inspiration from, and also do strategic investments in terms of our commitment on Project Argonaut, our sandbox and our early adopter program that I'll share in, in a bit. In terms of our roadmap, this is our initial roadmap with FIRE being an evolving standard. We are creating a quarterly cadence around that. The goal here is for our clients to get up to speed with FIRE implementation quickly with minimum implementation time, cost and risk. So this approach um, we, we, you see here that there are three swim lanes. The top is the fire technology assets. These are the assets that we're building on top of our core APIs in terms of northbound APIs, creating fire ready APIs. Uh, it will include the developer portal. We want it to be easy for your developers to connect uh, to smart documentation and access those APIs. And the, the key component here also is a consent management framework. As the substitutable apps will become a mainstream, there will be a need for consumer to give the, their consent to access, for an app to access their data on their behalf. And that's the consent management framework that we have built and deployed in our telco vertical. And we are now planning to bring that into healthcare uh, for fire adoption. Similarly, the second swim lane talks about the fire connectors and transformations as I uh, shared with you earlier. This is regarding creating the fire to non-fire mapping. And more importantly here, we are bringing the connector framework, which is a declarative mapping, to map any non-fire resources to fire and vice versa. Uh, we are also, when we are working with different clients, we are also getting requests to actually store the fire objects and, and persist them in, in their JSON format in the data store. In that regard, they were looking into a non-SQL type of way to store the fire objects. And that's where this second swim lane talks about. The third swim lane is around sandbox. This is a strategic investment around creating a publicly available commercial grade sandbox, uh, which will give the early access to the, these fire technology assets that I just shared with you all, and more to uh, come on sandbox in our uh, next slide. So the sandbox opportunity is where we will establish a commercial grade fire implementation with the assets that I just shared with you on the roadmap. And we are actively recruiting our marquee clients, uh, the, the clients that we already have relationships with. Uh, we are very positive that this will help reduce the learning curve in terms of fire adoption. 
it will help with time to market because if that's your API management platform in production, getting an early access to a publicly available sandbox will speed up the process. And also, you will learn from the other implementation from other clients like yourselves in, in, the, in the sandbox environment. The last but not the least, I guess a very important point, uh, we have, by virtue of being the API management and doing that a number of years, and being in present in different industries like telco, retail, and financial, we have a very robust access to developer services program. And as such, we have 100,000 developers who know of Apogee platform and are innovating on top of it. We are, through the sandbox, we, we are positive in recruiting some of these talent uh, and developers to the healthcare sector so that the innovations that Josh mentioned, the substitutability of the apps, they, those experiences can be built. So uh, how do you get early access? Um, the next steps here are you can sign up for the sandbox. We are creating an interest list and recruiting um, our clients there. We are also creating and kicking off an Apogee Healthcare Advisory Council. Anish Chopra, who's the advisor to the firm, uh, will be chair for this council. The idea here is to learn from the real life implementation and, and advise and inform our roadmap and also learn from each other. The, the last point here is around initiating discovery. You can reach, us, reach to us and see where in the fire journey I shared the layered architecture do you want us to help you innovate on. It could be as simple as creating those northbound APIs, it could be customizable assets, it could be uh, through the sandbox. So all the three areas are open for our clients to um, get access to our FIRE offering. The idea here is to get up to speed with the FIRE standards quickly with minimal implementation time, cost and risk. And in doing that, you can play a pivotal role in validation of this new standard and technology component as it is getting built. Kind of giving you a say in how the final standard will be rolled out. So that's all I had. Uh, as I summarize the webcast today, we learned from Josh, thank you for an excellent in-depth presentation on FIRE and why it is important, why there's so much energy behind it. Uh, we also learned about Smart and FIRE Initiative, which is uh, a reference implementation from the open source community. We are also, I also shared Apogee's commitment in accelerating FIRE implementation for our clients. So with that, I would uh, like uh, for us to open it up for question and answers. So our first question is, as independent app developers, will these APIs be available to us without having a relationship with the healthcare vendors? Josh, do you want to take that? So I, I can, yeah. sure, I'll, I'll at least provide uh, one perspective. So our, our goal from the Smart Platforms project has been to provide infrastructure by defining these APIs. We host a gallery where anyone can um, install an app and, and run it against some of the sample data that we host. And that's at, at gallery.smarthealthit.org. Uh, when it comes to how these applications will be deployed within provider organizations, uh, there's a few ways that this can go. Uh, and our goal has been not to try to specify or at least to over-specify that because I think there are a few, few ways that we could succeed here. And so one that we see happening already today is uh, uptake from electronic health record vendors. So for example, Cerner has said uh, that they plan to support Smart on Fire in their 2015 release. Uh, and Epic has said that they're going to have the, the first Fire services available in their 2015 release as well. Uh, so to the extent that these vendors are, are able to bake support for these APIs right into the electronic health worker product, product uh, I think that they'll start to offer stores that work on their specific system. Uh, and they may decide to establish channels by which uh, they actually act as a middleman um, and make applications available to clinical settings that way, uh, or they may simply uh, offer a way for application developers to talk with individual hospitals who care about that functionality. I think those are both possibilities, and in the early days, we'll probably see both. Um, but a third channel is a system outside of the EHR, uh, and, and something like the platform that Apogee is describing, something like a, a data warehouse that I, I know many um, academic medical systems 
already invest in as a matter of uh, research and quality assessment, uh, those things become targets for running apps on as well. I, I think we haven't yet tried to lick the problem of how to distribute one app across hundreds of different systems. Our focus has been on making sure that one app can talk to those systems in a consistent way. Yeah, thank you, Josh. I think the only thing I'll add to that is APIs are the core of the self-service nature of making that relationship. So what that what this will eliminate is point-to-point -point connectivity. So in today's world, if you need a data from a provider, it's, it's a very complicated file-driven process where the files are being exchanged. Through APIs, there is a secure, safe, and authenticated way to get access to the data. Of course, they'll have to qualify the request from the developer standpoint. It's a lot more easier, a lot more self-service. Okay, we have a second question here. This is a good one. Which national markets do you think will move first? Josh? I, I didn't understand the second word. Which what market? Which national markets do you think will move first on fire? I, I wonder if we could get clarification. Do you think it's a question about uh, different countries and, and, and who's, who's going to start adopting these specifications first? That's how I was reading it. Like, is it U.S. adopting FHIR versus National Health Services as an example? Oh, yeah. So it, it's a great question. And I, I think one thing that we could say objectively is that we see participation in the FHIR community uh, from all around the world. Um, I, I think we, the last time we did this tally, there have been implementers working on FHIR-related tools and services uh, in every continent, uh, every continent except uh, Antarctica. So we, we really do see a very broad and international group working on defining the spec and working on initial implementations. I, I think it's reasonable to expect uh, people will use FHIR in different ways in different places to meet uh, key business needs. Mm -hmm. So in places where there's already, for example, a, a robust network uh, of infrastructure tying together um, things like provider identities and where there are already um, national messaging services in place. Uh, we might see Fire coming from the outside and helping support new functionality like mobile applications, uh, but still using some of the elements of the existing infrastructure like provider identifiers. Um, and in other places where there's less automation already on the ground in healthcare IT, I think we'll start see, to see Fire actually coming in closer to the core to handle things like basic message routing for, for lab requests and lab results. Things that, uh, you know, in the U.S. world at least, are today HL7 V2 and will probably stay that way for this foreseeable future. Uh, if you don't have a, a deep install base in V2, uh, then Fire would look like a natural place to begin. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I would agree with that. I think that's where it will be the um, de facto language, not now, but if it's a well-defined data model, people will start exchanging that and there could be multiple different use cases. Um, we have one more question. It, see, it says, FHIR seems very EMR and hospital-centric. Health plans as a source of data do not fit as well in the data model. So I think from the, the core perspective of the problems that FHIR is trying to solve, um, they're not just about EMRs. You know, one of the things that differentiates the, the resources that went into FHIR uh, from some previous versions of uh, healthcare standards are that there has been a pretty strong focus from the beginning on patient-centered care, on providing a set of APIs that could really be the basis of a forward-looking personal health record. Um, but I think it's fair to say that FHIR is concentrated on solving the kinds of problems that aren't, uh, that aren't the purview of other domains. So there's a focus on clinical data models uh, because we can't, we can't get clinical data domain models uh, from anywhere else. Effectively, the FHIR initiative set out to define those because there was a need for them. Uh, you know, there's been less effort, or there hasn't been effort within the FHIR community, I should say, to define things like um, identity management uh, because it's pretty well recognized that there are existing external standards like, uh, like OpenID Connect, for example, which we use in SMART uh, for conveying uh, identity information between parties. So FHIR, FHIR has tried to focus on the problems that are specifically related to the healthcare domain, um, but they do include resources for clinical data, uh, as well as an emerging set of resources for financial claims and, and eligibility and coverage data, uh, things like contracting and consent. Uh, and the set of resources is uh, 
growing and it's informed by community interest. One of the things I should say about the FIRE community um, is that it's very much uh, participatory and it's a meritocracy. And what we see with, within um, the way the specification is developed is it's by folks who want to get involved and who have a use case that isn't being met by the spec today uh, and want to drive direction uh, in a way that would be more useful. So I would encourage you, if you look at the spec, and first of all, make sure you're looking at the most recent version because that's where all the, the newest financial and claims resources live. Uh, but if you look at it and you see a gap, uh, share that back with the community. There's a few key channels through which you can share it. Um, at the bottom of every page in the specification, there's a feedback link uh, where you can have a, a conversation um, through web forums, where you can submit an item to FIRE's bug tracker, uh, or there's a FIRE email list and Skype channel, which are quite active for this kind of discussion. Um, and I, I would say that in terms of the overall intent, uh, it is very broad, uh, and I would encourage you to get involved if you see something missing. Right, Josh, and I think from um, FIRE perspective, like EMRs were built as system of records, where we see from Apogee perspective, FIRE will enable system of engagement in that they are much more closer to the patients than EMR were ever in. So in that, I have a short story to share here when we implemented at Kaiser, so one of the comment I got once was, when the patient walks in, they see back of the screen of what doctor is typing from the EMR. But when you have a mobile app, a customer or the patient is much more participating in their own health, and that's what we mean by fire enabling those experiences. It's taking those EMRs and bringing it to the uh, from the to to the patients through the mobile mobile app. So very much agree with you on the intent on fire enabled experiences is to make it more patient-centric, make it more consumer-centric. There's one more question. Uh, this is regarding Josh on fire collection resources. The question reads, why patient as against patients? Also, the version field placement is not part of the request. Any comments on fire specs specific to how resource collection definition deviate from social URL? And this is getting the weeds of the implementation. Sure. Uh, so I, I think the question, the, the first part of the question was about um, effectively whether resource names are singular or plural. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in FIRE, the, the resources that go into the URL structures are, are all singular. It's just a convention. Um, you can get one patient uh, by specifying the ID of one patient, or you can search for a set of patients by providing a set of search parameters. Uh, but, in, but in each case, you're going to a URL that has uh, the word patient singular in it. Um, and I think the, the motivation there was just to, to provide one consistent URL at which the data about patients lives. Um, if, you're get, if you're getting just one patient or multiple, to have one, one convenient way to do it. Um, ultimately, it's a bit of an arbitrary decision whether you want to make them plural or singular, as long as you do it the same way across the board. Um, and so the, the decision here was, was for singular URLs. Uh, will you remind me of the second part of the question? The second part of the question is, any comments on fire spec specific to how resource collection definition deviate from social URL? Without a little bit more flavor, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. I, I, if it's really just about sort of singulars versus plurals, I would say it, it doesn't seem to make too much difference as long as you have one fixed convention and, and so fire picked one. Yeah, got it. But I, I may be missing uh, some of the subtlety there, and, and please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, you can email me afterwards, and I'll, I'll be happy to dig in if I missed the point. Now there's one more question. It says, do you see the FIRE API ecosystem make it easier for the patients to understand and control their privacy while pushing the EMR vendors from hiding from innovation in the name of privacy? Well, I think one of the, the great things about providing APIs to data that patients can control um, is that it gives, it gives patients or healthcare consumers uh, a way to select the, which parts of data they want to share uh, and what tools they want to share it with. Uh, I would say inherently, FIRE can be used in a number of different settings. So it's possible for a hospital to make a FIRE deployment that is accessible to patients, uh, where patients can uh, bring their own apps to the table. It's also possible to have a fire deployment uh, where patients can use it, but only with a few apps that the provider organization approves of. 
Um, and it's also possible to have a fire implementation where just the healthcare providers get to use it, and it's not accessible to patients. Uh, from my personal perspective, you know, I, I've been pushing hard on the policy front uh, to make sure that patients have access to just the same data and APIs that providers have. I think that the patients and providers both benefit from the same data types. Sometimes they may want to use different apps uh, to interpret the information at different levels, but ultimately the data that fuel both sets of decisions should be the same. I think there's a, a strong principle of parity there. Uh, and I've been pushing hard, um, in the U.S. at least, to see us move towards an ecosystem where patients can bring the apps that they choose to the table uh, rather than having providers make the decision about what apps you can use to access your own healthcare data. But it's still very early days. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of organizations uh, jumping in with both feet towards that degree of um, radical patient access. And I think it's natural to expect uh, that we'll see organizations dip their toes in, uh, first by exposing data to providers within their own firewalls, then by exposing data to specifically chosen patient apps, and getting comfortable with the technology stack and with the security properties of the stack uh, before they're willing to really open things up and uh, let patients bring their own apps to the table. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, there's one uh, last question, and that's how do we participate in the Healthcare Advisory Council from Apogee? The answer here is we are kicking it off at I Love APIs conference, which is from October 12th and 14th. As I shared with you, Anish Chopra, who's the executive advisor to the firm, will be sharing, uh, will be chairing the uh, Healthcare Advisory Council, and we are creating an interest list now, so please feel free to send us the email for if you're wanting to participate in the sandbox or during the I Love APIs conference, which will be our kickoff for the Healthcare Advisory Council if you want to be a member, member for that. All right, I think with that, we will uh, wrap our webcast today. Thank you, Josh, for an uh, incredibly in-depth and in informational session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.